Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And today we have a very premier author. We have a woman who's made her way in life as a journalist in many places. Began the quest for good journalism in a place called Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, Did good time here in San Francisco writing about food and restaurants for the San Francisco Chronicle. And then uh, somewhere your uh, publicist says you, you got to the the top tier of food writing uh, when you went to the New York Times. Oh. I find that insulting. I, I, I do too. <laughs> I uh, for, Let me see that sheet. Let me rip that up for you. <laughs> I can't find it, but I read it. I really, really did. Right. So at any rate uh, – the thing that I, I admired about uh, learning about you was that you've you, you've stuck to it, and and you've been a writer, and you've been a journalist, and 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 then now you've done a a very fine book, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to meet people like that who stick to it. Oh, thanks. thanks. And it, and it ain't been easy. Right. Well, you know, journalism was a. I was like a lot of. Uh, you know, post Watergate babies, and we all got out, went to journalism, ran off to journalism school, and thought we would change the world. And how's that working out for you, right? But uh, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, was fortunate enough to be um, working at a time when you could start at a small paper, work hard, move up to a little bit larger circulation paper. We were like, you know, traveling uh, carnival acts there, and just yeah. sort of move from town to town, and bigger circulation and bigger circulation, and. Um, I think the game's changed now, but uh, that was really the the early days of that. And you know, frankly, even since high school, uh, I was just such a screw up in high school. And the only thing that I ever was good at was uh, I was fortunate to be at a weekly high school paper, and they let me write stuff. And so um, it really uh, it really uh, sort of set the path for me. Journalism is in your blood. I like it. Yeah, it's great stuff. And newspapers too. I'm I'm. Uh, uh, I still get three newspapers delivered to my house every day, and I think I'm the last one. What but. a wonderful person you are! <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I got to support my own product, right? Yeah, yeah. It ain't it ain't easy anymore. I mean, it looks like never mind. Let's not talk about what's probably going to happen to newspapers. I don't know. If you can say it in 140 characters, then you're okay. <laughs> oh. The uh, somewhere here, here it is. The uh, reason behind this book, you get to it right in the introduction, and that's what really attracted me to doing the book, and I said, this is the way it's going to be. I want to interview this 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 author. And uh, that that you tell us that you're going to write about food, but, but, but much more. You're going to write about your heroes. And you write, my heroes are women who never abandon the kitchen. They use cooking as a source of strength. Their recipes have helped save their communities and kept families together. They have made political change through their love of food. These are women who can whip egg white just long enough that they don't cross the subtle line between soft peaks and stiff. That's a hell of a skill right there. It is, actually. That that is a hell of a skill. And uh, to them... Braising a piece of inexpensive beef until it becomes a slick, tender miracle or picking exactly the right plum from the produce bin is as natural as turning over in bed. That's what we used to call uh, years ago that, that, that it's, it, it's a hobby to us, and, which is more than a habit. It's in part of your being mm-hmm. uh, that you do these things and you do them well. And that's, I think, what you're talking about. They also know, these uh, heroes, that the best thing to do in a crisis <laughs> is feed people something soothing. A cup of tea, a spoonful of warm polenta and mushrooms, a perfect roasted chicken stuffed with Meyerlands. I'm getting hungry. I am quite hungry, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they've been keeping you away from food. I know. I know. Here I am in the amazing Bay Area, back home, and there are so many things I could eat. I every I could ever spend every fifteen minutes eating a different thing. I'll tell you (laughs) if I had the time. Toward the end of the introduction, I think you kind of sum it up. The women in this book became my tour guides, helping me figure out what I really believed in, how to remake my life, and recreate a family, and finally. 
how to face death. He did all of that for you? These well, women? it's not my death because I'm still here, but yes. Yeah. Well, Your it, mom's. Right? Yeah, talking about sort of the big loss of parents and, uh, you know, the table, really, the food is really what uh, I think has brought, uh, has brings solace and lessons to everybody. And if you think about how you, even from the beginning, how did you learn how to, you know, wait your turn to talk? How you learn to, you know, share, you save the last piece of chicken for the person next to you. So sort of the tribal fire, you know, yeah, the table yeah, is, yeah. I think, for a lot of us. Yeah. Um, and so I was able to look at how I kind of went through my life and my career and uh, these women in my book came came to me, you know, like I think you do kind of conjure up the people you need at the time, came to me and taught me life lessons from the table. What a beautiful thing. And the horror that I'm thinking of as you're talking about that, of the necessity of the table and the gathering around it, mm -hmm. is where are we in this country today in, mm -hmm. in terms of dinner or supper? Right. It's very disturbing. It's getting better, though. You've got to have faith. Okay, the eight <laughs> the eight cooks in the subtitle to Spoon Fed, who are they? What did they do? Uh, just stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Spoon Fed, How Eight Cooks Saved My Life, a memoir by Kim Severinsen, and the book is published by Riverhead Books in paperback. That's what we're talking about. Our friends over at the Bay Guardian said something nice, which I will share with you. Severson's life lessons are never heavy-handed. Thank God. Her stories carry impact due to the heartfelt candor with which she shares her insecurities and fears and what she has achieved in facing them. That's right from the first story about, is it Sarah Cunningham? Mar uh, Mary Cunningham, Mary right. Cun the, yeah, the yeah. grand and, dame of American home cooking. And you're driving uh, in a... Uh, Car that I never a heard Daihatsu, of. A Daihatsu, which... A Daihatsu yeah. SUV. <laughs> Let's just say mistakes were made, okay? <laughs> but you you drove that... No, you didn't drive did, it down I, well, from I, Alaska. I drove it to Alaska. To Alaska, but it, it came back right, on uh, a barge. It came back barge. on a barge and never worked the same ever since. <laughs> well, it's got, so. it got salt water soap. I tell you. You know? Never it, do that. <laughs> just tip tip for all you kids out there. Don't ship your cars if you can help it on a barge in the ocean. So, what, you didn't learn anything from Mary Apparently. about cars. No, I didn't, although she drove a Jaguar very famously yes, around town. Yes, all around with the town. They always, money that she, she made from here, her. Here comes Marion with the Jaguar. Right, right, and her, from money from her first big advance for the Fanny Farmer cookbook, so... <laughs> Back in the day when the advances were big enough where you could buy a Jaguar. But wow. Prices on Jaguars were small enough that's that you true. could buy a Jaguar. <laughs> Come on now. And one of the things that you got that you learned from uh, uh, Marion was the whole business of stopping drinking. Right. And, 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 and how she had achieved it at a rather advanced age, 51. Right. She was, yeah, in her 50s and uh, early 50s and – um, you know, I had just left Alaska where I'd had a, a long and uh, notorious life drinking a lot and uh, quit, decided I had to quit and uh, had just gone through that and came down and Marin Cunningham was one of the first assignments I had for the San Francisco Chronicle and she was very famously my good friend of the man who was my boss and who hired me, Michael Bauer, the, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, you know, the very talented and lovely food critic for the San Francisco Chronicle and yeah. uh, who did, you know, I... I'm greatly indebted. He taught me a lot. And uh, but anyways, my first assignment went out to her house and just totally feeling like a failure and a, like I was not gonna. I just like a fraud, and they'd hired the wrong girl, and just you know barely sober. And uh, interviewed her. Spent the afternoon in her kitchen, and I can I could still uh, you know smell the coffee. And we had cookies. And uh, after a while, we talked, and I told her just about what a fraud I thought I was, and that I quit drinking recently. And she goes, "Well, dear, I." I had to put, I used to carry a gin bottle around in my purse and I had to stop too. And isn't life much better? And she stopped at 50, went up and uh, uh, became James Beard's assistant uh, for 11 years and had a terrific post 
uh, drunk career. And I thought, wow, if, if she could do it, uh, I could do it. And, and that yeah. idea that whenever you want, you can start over, that uh, the future's in front of you and at any point you can change gears and start over. And then she said something else to me when I, at the end of that, she said, well, I think you're pretty terrific, dear. And sometimes you just hear that right thing you need to hear from somebody at the right minute moment. So that life lesson with Marion was really about uh, you can start over whenever you want. Another uh, of your of, of your uh, cooks uh, uh, was one that, that worried you because you always thought that she was brighter and more brilliant than you were. And from her, uh, Ruth Reichel, you learned uh, to stop comparing yourself to other people. Yeah, Ruth. Ruth, I, you know, that was another. She's, as we all know, she's got several great memoirs out, and she went on to be the— she was a L.A. Times food editor and a critic at the New York Times and uh, went on to, of course, very famously edit Gourmet Magazine. Um, and, uh, you know, I was I just thought she was like the she's like the head cheerleader. You know, she's like the popular girl. And I uh, when I first came here, her book Tender at the Bone had just come out. And uh-huh. uh, I remember riding Bart and reading reading that book. And I'd go by her house, try to figure out where she had lived. And I was getting all stalkery, you know, and single white female on her and. It wasn't, yeah. So anyway, but I just thought she was uh, just better than me. And uh, um, and that may or may not be true, but I, I, after going to New York and having some lunches with her and uh, learning some lessons, I realized that, uh, you know, she always thought that Alice Waters and that whole crew was, that th- those were her popular girls and that she mm-hmm. had her own version of people she thought uh, were better than she was. And I really learned that you just can't compare yourself to other people because it just makes you feel bad and you can only be who you are. Um, so, uh, that was, that was kind of the lesson from Ruth. Let's talk a little bit about Alice Water. You spent a good deal of time in the book and her, but one of the things that, that you write that I thought was extraordinary, I'd like to share with our folks, the build up to dinner, you write at Chez Panisse is huge, but unless one is prepared, the first time can be underwhelming, underwhelming at Chez Panisse. You may be Put out Is lightning home. striking in yeah, here? You may, what? You, you may be oh thrown my gosh, out, man. I'm getting, I'm, Whoa. You yeah. sit down to a few nuts and a little aperitif, move into a plate of raw halibut, and then a pile of greens, pork, and shelling beans. The meal ends with a little dish of peach ice milk, and the bill is $95 before the tax, the drinks, and the automatic 18% gratuitous. For some people, the only reasonable response is, what the hell? (laughs) That is the most objective, balanced thing I've ever read about Alice's Chez Finis because I've driven people who, you know, they were in that state of shock when I finally got around to picking them up. Well, it is, you know, the food there, you have to, and this is where having some knowledge about what you're going to eat helps because... uh, it is hard when you're considered one of the best restaurants in America. Yeah. And, of course, those expectations are tremendous. And, uh, you know, there are certain people for whom spending $95, you... Is easy. You want some... Yeah, it's not... But, you know, for a lot of us, that's a, that's a lot. That's some real money right there. Well, like, like journalists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You Spoon know. Fed takes you behind the scenes of great cooks and what they do. Also tells the story of some secrets, like Pringles. Oh, Pringles. Stay tuned for Pringles. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Please remember today's title. It's Spoon Fed, How Eight Cooks Save My Life. A memoir by Kim Severson. It's in paperback now, so don't give me the price problem. You don't have one. One of the the, uh, people who've uh, written nicely about the book, something called San Francisco Magazine, which is still around. God bless them. I think. Yeah, it is. And they say alcoholism coming out, struggles with personal identity. The staple ingredients of the modern memoir are rendered fresh. In Kim Severinsen's never self-indulgent, and that's the key. That's fresh because it ain't self-indulgent. Never self-indulgent, always honest new book. That's so nice. Yeah, Love that's those. Good. Love them. 
That's right. I on, heart San Francisco magazine. That's right on target. It's right on target. You may want to come back from Georgia. I think I'm going to have to. Yeah, clearly. think about all the wonderful the people who love you. Here. That's right. Patch my people. <laughs> now, uh, one of the things that you uh, talk about here is that when when people ain't looking. Uh, some of these important food individuals will will do something unexpected, like in one case, eat Pringles. Oh, my friend Clark Wolf, who, as you know, has been uh, an arbiter of good taste in food for many, many years in the yeah, Bay Area, starting with the Oakville Grocery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we were talking. We told, we're talking a lot about taste benchmarks and why you know. You know, you want to taste a certain thing and eat a certain thing and eat the best expression of it, so you always understand what it tastes like. And then I, you know, we were having this long and involved conversation about that. And I asked him, I said, "But really, don't you? I mean, all the time." And he said, "Well, except for when I'm alone in a hotel room." And then he said, "I like some eat some Pringles." So I and he was just he's like, oh, "I can't believe you put that in that I eat Pringles." He's a Pringles guy, but you know what? We all have something that just you know. Well, you like yourself, I mean. Oh. You and Here your and your Lipton uh, soup French dip. onion soup, French, that sour yeah. cr- And I'm telling you what, you put that out at a party with some uh, ruffles, and I prefer the reduced fat ruffles with that dish. I think it, the balance is better. Reduced uh, yeah. fat ruffles. It's a chips. very fine-tuned thing. But, you know, because it reminds me of in the... <laughs> In the, you know, my, the basement of my parents' house when I got to have my first kind of like party with my friends over and we had, my mom had made the onion soup dip and, you know, it's the taste of adulthood. It's the taste of freedom. I was going to have a party with my friends and, yeah, yeah. you know, I was a little, you know, And eating, it, eating, eating one of the and, dishes that the adults eat. You know, and I felt like I was having the fancy cocktail party food there, you know, and so it was a big deal. But I remember that, you know, <laughs> I remember football Sundays at oh. my house and <laughs> my dad and, you know, they, they, he would have some of that dip and so it's that uh it's that memory that's connected to crappy food it's it's genius <laughs> crappy food please some, some of us stuff. still eat that stuff hey, on football sundays come on I'll tell you be nice i'm coming over the most important cook in this book is your mom yeah and 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 uh you you were always trying to make the relationship between the two of you better uh, to 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 be more loving and to receive more love in return, and I want you to read from the part of the book where time is running out. Yeah, my mother um, has Parkinson's, and uh, you know I went to take care of her uh, for it. And where do you want me to start here? Just uh, over the, the next, next week. week? So yeah. I went to take care of her at her house in Colorado. Yeah. Uh, over the next week, she started to feel much better, and we began to have longer talks over coffee at her kitchen table. One of them was about Marcella Hazan. I told my mother I wanted to write about Marcella in part because of the cookbook my mom had given me 25 years earlier. She remembered the book, but she didn't remember why she gave me that one in particular. I guess I just liked it, and I thought you would, she said. You always like cookbooks. Again, it's those expectations. For my mom, it was a nice book she thought I'd like. For me, it was some kind of talisman a connecting that connected me to my culture, to my mother, my connection to the kitchen and to the great women cooks I would later become so enchanted with. It was all about finding a connection to my mother. I kept pushing. Did she think I was a good cook even back then? Was I always interested in cooking? What kind of child was I? The questions poured out. I was hungry for answers and I didn't get many. Well, you were in the kitchen a lot with me a lot, she said. Although I'm not sure what I really wanted to hear, her answers were wholly unsatisfying. I moved into deeper territory. Did she remember the letter I wrote to her about being gay back when I was just getting out of college? She didn't, but then she told me how much she loves Katya and how excited she is about her newest granddaughter. Did she ever wish we talked more, talked earlier? I suppose she said, but what's done is done. And that's really it. What's done is done. It's kind of a mantra, mantra for my mother. For her, the phrase signals that it's time to stop wallowing and move on. You can't change the past. What is, is, and what's done is done. I never used to understand those expressions, but now I see them as more useful than any other tools she could have given me. They signal acceptance, and acceptance is the key to my happiness. Of all the lessons I've learned from the wise women of the kitchen, that I can always start over, to be true to myself, to stop measuring myself against other people, to have faith and humility, and to always stay close to family, it came down to this. The past is past, and I have no control over the future. Letting go of all the pain and missteps in my past and embracing hope in tomorrow is the only way I'm going to truly be happy today. I work every day on being grateful for what I have, even if it's not what I planned. I accept what comes my way. What other choice is there? The only thing that could have made that 
more perfect, I think, is See, if, everybody's an editor now. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. If if you could have had the conversation at the black table, mm. you know, where things yeah. kind of started the in table. your relationship with your right. with, with your mom, but yeah. it, it wasn't. But that's the, family the essence. Table. Yeah, the essence it is of the family it table. is what happens at the black the family table. Yeah. This is, is an old the black family table that we grew up eating breakfast around and dinner around and which uh, I opened my book talking about my my brother has it now he's in Boston so there you go he will go to bro- Boston your brother has it yeah yeah I got the dining room table and he took the he kitchen got- <laughs> table <laughs> okay okay yeah. one of the things that you said in a, in another interview uh, that that was hard for you to discuss or write about in the book was religion. Yeah. And where you've wound up with it. Yeah, and faith. I, I, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, you know, I, I pray every day. I uh, got, you know, I process of getting sober, you kind of realize that something saved your ass along the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, I do, but, you know, in the food world, we never talk. I mean, I can tell you how many meals I've sat down to, and never does anyone say, let's just pause for a minute and have a moment of silence and be grateful for what we have here. And boy, we're eating some amazing food with some amazing people. But you know, what is it? That's communion. Food, yeah, it is. It's communion. It so uh, it's funny. You just, trust me, sit down in a fancy New York restaurant with your fancy foodie friends and suggest everybody say a prayer before they start eating. Yeah. You're going to, yeah. yeah. Well, Spoon Fit, that's the title of the book. The subtitle, How Eight Cooks Saved My Life. The author who's been with us is Kim Severson. This is Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email jimfostercoc at gmail.com.